Hello, George Hepworth here, Grover Park Consulting. Let's build Mike's mobile library. In this session today, day five, we're going to look at the initial stages of setting up a development environment for our Power Apps application and begin the process of putting items or objects into that environment uh, to show you how that uh, works. You'll notice that I've already gone ahead and created a second subsite for the development. I decided not to walk you through that whole process as part of this uh, development of the Power Apps application itself, partly because I ran into some interesting challenges in copying those SharePoint lists cleanly and efficiently over into the new environment, and I thought it would take way too much time uh, out of our project to show you that. Instead, I'll refer you to other uh, sources for uh, copying uh, SharePoint lists from one subsite to another. And if, uh, if there's enough interest, and you can provide that information to me in, in the comments, if there's enough interest, I'll go back in and do a video on that. But I think that there are other resources on that part that you'll find useful. It's also true that in a typical Power Apps application environment, uh, we don't always see a separation into de development in, in production and, and even development testing and production. Uh, this is something that uh, software developers, database developers in general are, are very accustomed to doing and don't feel comfortable not doing. So. Uh, I think it's important for you to follow that same practice. And, and we had a recent presentation in my Access Pacific chapter of the Access user groups on, on the software development lifecycle. Kent Gorell explained how he manages that whole process for his clients. And if you want to know more about that, I, I will link that video in the comments section below and you can go and watch that. It's a little over an hour long, but it's well worth the investment of your time to, to really get a good grounding in, in the software development life cycle. Let's look at development site that I have initially set up. Okay. I copied all of the SharePoint lists from the production site into this development site. I probably should stop and explain that originally when I was building this, the production site, what I'm now calling the production site, was the development site. But now that it's more or less complete and shouldn't have any significant changes to it going forward, it will be my production version. And this development version will be where I will uh, develop and, and implement try out new uh, features and functions before I implement them in the production environment. As I said, I already copied the lists over. Uh, they are identical to the existing lists, or as close to identical as I could make them to the original lists in the production version, uh, including I copied over and set up all of the, all of the records that are, are there. Next, we need to go and look at the Power Apps app section. To do that, we need to go, excuse me, we need to go here, select Power Apps from our selection of apps in our Office 365 account. When we reach the Apps section, we see that I have my original backup that I made. I make backup copies quite regularly, even though within uh, the Power Apps environment, it does maintain a, a series of versions. I like to have a full, complete, separate backup copy, I guess, because of years of experience with Access that I just am not comfortable without a, a recent backup copy just in case something goes wrong. So I always do that. We have Mike's mobile library, and now we're going to create our new development copy 
of Mike's mobile library. We start by clicking on New App. We'll make it, we'll make it a Canvas app. Model-driven apps are sort of canned. Well, in, in, the, in, in the Access world, we tend to think of templates. So a model-driven app uh, is in that same mold as a template. And a portal is a type of app that uh, an enterprise would use. I don't know too much about portal apps, so I won't go into that. But as my understanding is that they're, they're in, aimed at a, an organization-wide distribution. We're going to make a Canvas app. We have two choices, tablet and phone. Tablet is going to be the landscape layout, phone, the portrait layout. We'll call this Mike's Mobile. That was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Now, as Power Apps does its preparation in the background to set up this new application, we are faced with a blank screen and our app environment. This is a new feature that didn't actually exist when I created it the original version of this. I, I read about this just the other day, uh, and I won't go into that in detail here, uh, except to say that it is a way to immediately present a user with a start screen while they're waiting for code in the on start event to complete. In other words, it's going to improve the user experience by showing them a, a screen at the beginning while the on start is running. If, in other words, if, if under the old method, you would not see the start, the start screen until the code in the on start had run, completed. So, so this is a way to improve it. We'll start with the on start. We have no code here. Now, there are two ways to do this, and I'm going to do it the lazy way, which I think is the way that all good development runs. What I'm going to do is start a second copy of the browser. I'll put it on my other monitor out of sight, and I will begin copying items from the existing Mike's mobile library application over here to speed up the process of uh, recreating it. So I'm going to stop for a minute, set that up, and I'll be right back. Okay, we're ready to proceed. I have started on my other monitor, the original Mike's mobile library application, and I'm ready to copy the code from the on start. You will immediately notice that it throws errors, and I get my little error checker here. It looks like a stethoscope, I think, because it's what that's supposed to be checking the health of the application, immediately starts throwing errors. And that's because many of the things that are found in the on-start object or start on-start event really don't exist yet. For example, the options screen, which I mentioned before. Until I get all of the items and, and objects and, and labels and everything set up correctly here, there will continue to be errors. And that's one way of actually gauging our progress, uh, is as long as there are errors showing, it indicates we're not up to speed yet. So I'm going to collapse that, save. The initial save looks like this. Here are all my other existing apps. This is the one that we're going to save now. We can have this saved to the cloud in the Power Apps environment we're in now. We can also save it to my computer. We can save a copy to the local computer. 
we'll do the save. Here's the button down in the lower right hand corner. We'll save it. And now it's going to do the save process. We can share it. We're not ready to do that. We can look at all versions. And right now we should have only this first version. And again, loading this originally takes a little bit longer. But see, we just have the first version. What will happen as we continue to save and publish, save and share, save and publish, this version list will continue to grow. So we can actually go back to any previous version here. My main reason, as I said, for having my own separate saved copy of a backup is just primarily habit from the days of uh, being a developer uh, and wanting the security of a separate backup in a different location. If something were to happen to this in the entire version set were were somehow damaged, I would still have a copy of the most recent version that I saved, recent production version that I saved. So we're ready to start filling this in. The next thing we need from the existing app is the options screen. I'm not actually sure uh, if there is a way to copy a whole screen from a uh, one Power Apps application to another. Uh, I know you can duplicate a screen within a single Power Apps application, but I haven't yet figured out if I can copy the entire screen. I know that I can copy all of the objects off a screen, so I'm going to do that. I'll start by renaming the existing screen here, SCR Options, which is the exact same name as my uh, existing production screen. And if I go back to uh, the on start, you now see that this variable no longer shows an error because it's finding this option screen. So let's go to the other application out of sight on my second screen. I should be able to just copy and paste all of the objects from the option screen in the original production application straight over here. Let's see if I can make that happen. I've had mixed luck doing so. I'm going to do this. And yes, it worked. Got it in the wrong place, but it's here. I still I have errors because we're referring to variables that don't yet have valid values in our on start event. But we did get the three elements, the label, the back icon, and the app icon. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the rest of the labels from the production environment and paste them here. By default, they fall into the same location that they are on in the original. So now I have all of the controls, the test label, the dev label, the production label, the app icon, the back icon, and that's all of the items. We need to do a little bit of adjusting, and I'm going to walk through that now. This label has a width which is set to the parent width. That means that this label will always be exactly the same width of the screen on which it is placed. Its x is 0, which is 0 in from the left. 
that's the horizontal position, the Y, or the vertical position, is zero down from the top. Notice that it is overlapping this one. We need to set the top, or the Y, of this control a little bit differently. And I'm going to start by actually working from the bottom up, and you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. I'm going to take the Y position. Now it's hard-coded at 406. But rather than leave it hard-coded at 406, I want to make it also dependent on a different control on the same screen. That way, if I adjust anything above it, it will automatically adjust itself. And the way I do that is I take the position, the Y position of the label above it, which is label LBL. Oh, I've forgotten the name of this label. This is label GPC colors, of course. colors dot y and notice that it pops down so that its y position is exactly the same as this label but I want to make it move below that so I'm going to add l b l g p c colors height and so now it moves immediately below. But I want to leave a little bit of space. So I'm going to add 15. So now, regardless of where I move this label, the one below it will move the same way. What this allows me to do is set each of the controls, the labels, and that will, this will be true for other types of controls in relationship to one another, so that as I move any one of them, or excuse me, if I move the controlling one at the top, everything else will move in accordance with that. So I'm going to do that with this one, and we'll set the Y equal to L B L uh, L G P colors dot Y. So now they will always stay at the same height. If I move it, the other two move. For the X position, we will set it to uh, GP color, C colors, dot X. And that moves it right over the top of it because the two left edges are the same. We add to that, the width, and that places the left edge immediately touching the right edge of the prior label, and we'll add spacing between those. So now, regardless of where we move those two, those move, I have to do the same thing for this one. So we'll make its x dependent on that. So now these three labels will move in conjunction with one another. If I set the X for this master control to be, say, 64, the other two adjust themselves accordingly. Now let's work our way up. This one, which is the test label, I want to reflect the Y position of the label above it. So that will be L B L screen options 10. And that moves it right up over top of it. 
and I lost my Oh, I, that's because I, okay, this one I want, LBL. I accidentally clicked on it when I was trying to identify it. I, I clicked here, which is not what I wanted to do. I need to do SCR dev. Now notice that these are all case sensitive. If I just type Y, I get the error because that's the lowercase y. If I select the uppercase y, now it correctly moves it right on top of that label. So I'm going to add the height. And that moves it immediately below. And then I'll add my spacer. So now this label will move in, in relationship to the label above it. This one, I will set so that its Y position is in relationship to the one above it. Test Y plus LBL screen options test dot plus 30. We'll make that 30. So now all of these will move vertically in sync with one another. Let's double check our widths. I think those are all set correctly. Parent width. Width. And so now all we have to do is set this one so that its Y position is correct in relationship to the one above it. So its Y will be, it'll be S S C R options title prod dot Y, and that'll place it right on top of it, plus it'll be L S C R dot height plus 15. So now all of these labels will move in conjunction with each other, in sync with each other. We just need to fig fix the colors in our on start macro, our on start event. Still an access developer, still think in terms of macros. All of these now are operating correctly. No more errors in any of these. We still have to fix the rest of the errors in our on start to get it to run correctly. I uh, will stop here. Uh, I believe we've gone just about long enough for this session, although we haven't really uh, covered the entire setup. Uh, but I think in terms of what we've covered, I will let you, I'll leave you to digest what we've seen. When I come back in the next installment, what we'll do is look at setting it up so that the data is available. Uh, in, on this option screen, it's not reflecting any underlying data, but in order to finish the process of getting that option screen to work correctly, we do need the data, and that'll be the next step. So we have the data sitting in our development SharePoint lists. All we need to do now is add them, and I'll do that in my next session. So as always, if you like what you've seen, please hit the Like button, subscribe to my channel, come back soon for the next installment. Thank you.